So welcome to Research Methods. Um, my name is Dr. Richard Boateng and I'll be teaching you um, the basics of research for this particular session. Uh, we will start with why we do research. And um, as we progress forward with other sessions, you may, we may be joined by other lecturers to help understand quantitative research. I'll be teaching quant qualitative research. Okay. So today's session, we are focusing on what research is, what the research process entails, and what are the different types of research. So by the time I finish this session, the students who are participating in this class, or even other researchers who want to just refresh their memory or understanding about research, will learn what research is and what research is not, understand the classifications of research, and try to explain what a research process and a research design is. Good. So the session is divided into three key topics defining research, why we do research, the research process, and types of research. So I will begin with um, defining research. Good. Now, the key text we'll be using for this particular session is a book I wrote myself titled Research Made Easy, available on Google Books and other bookshops in Ghana. And um, we, for this session, it focuses on chapter one. Good. So defining research. Technically, one may ask a question that what is research about? And there are a lot of definitions that may exist. But in a basic form, research is an investigation into a particular social or business phenomena. Now, when you say that, it presupposes that every investigation is research. That means that if you, have, you are living in an African home and one morning you realize that somebody has drunk half of the milk and you want to do a, 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 an investigation to find out who drank the milk and you start questioning everybody in the house is this research these are some questions that somebody may ask is that research or is not research anyway let's see whether every investigation is research now this said one will argue that every investigation on a topic of interest is research i will not say that is true the reason is when we take it to a closer detail, research is an organized and systematic way of finding answers to questions. Now, the reason why we say it is systematic is that every research uh, follows a set of principles or procedures, which are usually set by a scientific body that accepts what is research in that particular scientific body or not. So if you go into medical science, there may be some rubrics or specifics that may be, or principles that may be outlined procedures in a medical research. And if you go into, um, let's say, social research, or if you leave medical science, and if you go into, you step into if even um, in law, and you want to try to look at uh, what is research in law, there may be certain specifics there that may be different. An engineer, what an engineer may call research, may not be entirely accepted by another type of um, scientific discipline. So for every scientific di discipline, there is what is accepted as research there. So whenever you want to define something as research, you ask yourself that, what scientific di discipline are you referring to? And what are the rubrics? Because it's a scientific discipline, the members of the scientific discipline that accept that what you have done is research or not. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. For example, let's Take um, let's take a very. If you go to um, a mechanic, and your car is broken down, he's going to ask you a number of questions. That um, have you changed, checked your oil? Have you done this? Have you done that? He try to engage you into an investigative process to know the possible reason. He's also trying to find what answers to the question of why your car is not working. So you go through a number of things, and then you ask that do you do this? If you don't do this, and you eliminate all the other possibilities to be able to arrive of the one particular reason why your car may not be working and then give you a solution now because he is a mechanic there are certain questions you ask now if you took that same car to a medical doctor he not ask you those questions is that not true now, again the medical doctor will not will take a stethoscope who will take your temperature can you take a temperature of a car no sometimes you can you can fill the the engine to check whether it's warm or not but technically, you cannot put a thermometer in the engine and say that I'm taking a temperature to be able to diagnose there. But modern science has even given us the diagnostic machines for cars now. I think we've heard about that, that you can put a machine in the car to tell you, um, 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 that it should be able to tell you whether, um, based on the model, what could be wrong with the car. Now, it's out of somebody's research that particular machine was 
has been developed to be able to help in the diagnostic process of finding out what is wrong with the car or not. In the same way, if you go to, if you are coming, your car has a taillight broken and I take it to a lawyer, the lawyer will ask different questions in arriving at the answer as compared to what the mechanic will ask. A policeman to me ask. So for every particular um, uh, discipline of science or of knowledge, there are certain rubrics or procedures that you may follow. That is why we say that a research is a systematic. Means that it has a defi defined set of scientific procedures and principles that have to be adhered to. Without adhering to them, sometimes we question the reliability and the validity of the research. Many of times you would have heard of an economist and a social scientist sitting on radio trying to talk about development issues. One is talking about just figures, another person is talking about what change has come to the people. And for each of them, they think their research is what? True and should be accepted. Because what an economist may use to define as progress in a community is different from what a social scientist may, and each of them have done some research to tell you. But one is more concerned about numbers, another is more concerned about change that may be more of a qualitative or descriptive sense. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So that's why we say that it's systematic. Another thing is that a research has to be organized. Organized because there is a structure which are sometimes generic. Means that there are certain things, steps that you follow. Every research, you respect the, 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 uh, the scientific discipline you belong to, will always seek to ask a question and find an answer. Now the answer can be yes, no, or maybe, but it's still an, what, a, an inquiry process. A process of inquiring. And because of that, we say that it's organized, following a method or a set of steps. It means that there's a process that you go through to get your answer. And that process, if you don't adhere to the principles in that process, we will say that your research is not well done. Okay. Now, a research will also find answers, and the answer can be yes, no, and maybe. So there's always an answer that a research may arrive at. Now, because the research is also looking for answers, a research will also has questions. Because of that, we say that for every research, there's what is central to the research and differentiates your research from my research is the question that is being asked. So the centrality of every research is the question that is being asked. What do I mean by that? For the same tail light of a car that is broken, the question that the lawyer will ask will be different from the question that a mechanic will ask and the question that the policeman will ask. Maybe the death of the policeman will be a little bit closer to that of the lawyer. But all of them will be what? Different. So the centrality of every research is the question that is being asked. If you go into a community and we are not, there is high teenage pregnancy and we'll bring an economist to ask a question, do a research, he will ask a particular type of question. If you bring a, a behavioral scientist coming from um, 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 maybe a school of public health to also find out why um, there is high teenage pregnancy, there'll be a different question. If you bring a cultural anthropologist from social science department to also ask, try to find out why there's high teenage pregnancy, he may lead to certain norms or cultural behaviors and patterns that because of the absence or the presence of them may be causing or may lead into um, the high teenage pregnancy. So what we say that the centrality of every research is a question that is being asked. So that if you do some research and your question is not right, the, question, the research falls apart. That is why that at the end of your research process, at the end of your thesis, at the end of the work, we ask that have you answered the research question? So I, I often try to encourage students that they should know that nobody can steal your topic. Your topic may be very broad, but the question you ask with the topic is what makes it unique. So we can all try to look at costing financial laws to the state, but you may want to look steady construction projects. I may want to study, um, let's say, uh, PPP projects. Even PPP projects can also be construction projects, but I can also look at a different set of projects. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. I could also look at leader, bad leadership as causing financial loss to the state. But that's a different, leadership is different from construction project. The questions are, maybe the construction project, my, my question may be more on financing. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Maybe poor financing or inappropriate use of what? Funds. But when I go to leadership, maybe become a poor project management, but the leader was not, was not able to monitor the activities to be able to meet the goal. And hence, it has caused financial loss to the state. So for every research, a, what is central to it is what? The question that is being asked. Good. So now we ask, why do we do research? Now, we may do research for a number of different reasons. 
one of the reasons why I may do research is to create something new or to cause something particular to happen. Mm? Or to make sense of what is happening. Now, if you want to cause something particular to happen, it's like you are predicting, predict what will happen, and then you find out if it will happen that way, will it really happen in A, if it actually happened in B. Or to explain what is happening or verify. Like going to a community, you want to try to find out why is this acting this particular way. Or to make a sense of what you have to describe what is going on. You see, description is different from explanation. Describe, make us describe what is going on and then explain to know what is behind what is going on. Okay. Now, in all of this, we can narrow them to three key facts. Research has can have three key focus can be our purpose. One is exploring what is going on. Two is seeking to understand or, d or describe. And the last one is meant to explain. And if you're able to explain and know, and, and, and know the variables, you can be able to what? predict. So we have got exploratory, and you've got understanding, and you've got um, explanatory. Now, because of the way research itself is f um, f structured, when you are doing research, you are inquiring. And because of your inquiry, we say there is a process of what? Knowledge discovery. And because you are also discovering, you may want to discover and you find out this is a truth. Why your tail out go broken? Or why there is high teenage pregnancy in this particular community? You have also created new knowledge. So the next, the, the next community will not do what the other community did. So research is a process of what? Discovery and it's also a process of what? Knowledge creation. And this is central to every type of research that we do. So we ask that what have you discovered? And what have you, you created? Now creating is that means that you actually, have you found something interesting or new? Or have you found something that is confirming what we knew already? Good. Now in the absence of research in every community or in every country, or even in society, people try to lean to the common sources of knowledge. That means that they look to authority, they look to common sense, tradition, media distortion, or personal experience. Now, because of these are, are common sources of what knowledge. For example, some new man who wrote a book on um, social science or so, a basis of social research talked about the fact that in the absence of research, people try to lean on these sources of knowledge. And he says that, he asks a question, why do you think women do the laundry? If he asks this basic question in every home or to every person. Now, some may say that it's because of the media myth most of the media um, um, commercials that you actually watch from some of the detergent companies, you see that the woman is the one doing the washing either with the daughter and the son may have been going to play, get dirty and brings it to the mother to wash. So even in Ghana, we have this tradition goes on, key soap, which is made by in Lever, Ghana. You see that the mother is sending up this bar of soap to the, the grandmother sends to the mother and the, the mother was sent to the daughter. Now, what you see here is that it means that who would do washing in a typical home? The woman. So there's some, some gender bias with laundry. Now, authorities will say that maybe females are taught to select, uh, uh, to mend or clean clothing as part in the house. While, whilst as you go to um, the male side, you see that males are often taught to be able to bring money home. That's in terms of what tradition may show. So some, in some communities, even mothers and fathers train their children that way. You call your daughter to the kitchen to help with washing, to help with things that have to do with cleanliness. Then you let the gentleman go out to hunt anyway, or the boy go out to hunt. Now, others will say common sense. Men are not just concerned about clothing. Or women are most often seen to do the, uh, see to, seen to do the, laundry from their own personal experience you see that that's what you, you experienced now in the advent of washing machine think things are changing <laughs> now what are, why are we saying this in the absence of research we lean to our common sources of knowledge and the common source of knowledge cannot be used to rule a country can a president just show up and just say that because i saw my mother doing it that is how i'm going to run the nation no we have to make sound decisions in companies and in institutions based on scientific evidence which may become from a scientific inquiry process, which may become from research. We can't just lean to the media distortions. We are not saying that these things do not feed into research. They can feed in, but we don't base all our decisions in life 
on these sources of knowledge. Good. So what is the research process? The research process ent entails the activities or the step-by-step -step process of carrying out a research project. So we have seven activities here. Selecting a topic, focusing on the question, designing a study, collecting data, analyzing data, interpreting data, and then informing others. Now all these activities are generic steps that is done in every type of research. You always have to have a question. You always have to design a study, find out how you're going to collect data to be able to address the question. You also have to be able to analyze the data, make sense of the data, and then come out with some conclusion and then inform others. Now, what is the essence of research if you do the research and it lies on your decks and nobody knows about it? Good. So, but in the centrality, you see, in the centrality of uh, all the steps here is what we call theory. Theory is the way that we see the world and how the world is like a, um, an established way of s understanding how things occur in this world. So, for example, somebody may say that there is something like the theory of plant behavior. A theory that explains why people act in a particular way. Now, sometimes when we do research, we use theory because it tells us to understand what we have learned from previous research to guide the future research. So that the future research that we are going to do or the new research that we are conducting, if it doesn't, the findings do not support what we began with, we realize that the current theories of understanding how the world is has been challenged. And then we reform our theory, we revise our theory about the world. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So we're trying to build research on theory, but it's not all research that starts from theory. Some research will generate theory, others research, other type of research will use theory to start and either confirm the theory or f um, re improve or revise the theory. Okay, we'll get into that in, uh, in future sessions when we are doing theoretical frameworks. Now, the research process can be expanded to look like this, 12 other steps. Where we are, we go into in, in closer detail, selecting a topic, defining and um, determining a problem, determining a research gap, determining some hypothesis, determining objectives, and determining a question. So what we have done is that we have opened the first two steps into about six other steps, and then we have the detailed literature review, the research framework, designing the research design, uh, uh, designing the research, collecting data, analyzing, interpreting data, and informing others. So this is about twelve steps, but. It's quite a lot for a, a, a fair session. So what do I do? I want to summarize into four key steps. Every research has to identify why you are doing the research. So what issue are you trying to investigate or what topic is on your mind? Is it about service marketing? Is it about relationship marketing? Or is it about e-commerce in developing countries? Or is it about mobile phone ap application development in Africa? Is that what you want to research on? Then you have to follow the topic that you have selected. You have to determine the right question to ask because the centrality of every research is the question that is being asked. After you have defined the right question, then you have to ask yourself, can I design a study that can help me find answers to that question? Hence, your methods come in. And after your methods of, of, of um, collecting the data and analyzing the data, then you interpret it to give us some means of what, some findings or some understanding that can be used to inform others about the answers to the question that you set out to find answers for okay so there are four key phases now the research process is different from the research design even though sometimes people think some people think it's synonymous now it's not synonymous it's they are related the research plan on how to implement the research in practice is known as the research design the research design describes how, when, and where data will be collected and how the data will be analyzed. So the design of the research is usually a subset of the research. The design of research is a subset of the research process, what I mean by that. So the process entails the whole our activity, when you are even conceptualizing the topic of what you want to research on. But so the design of the research is just a subset of the research process. Technically, what you try to realize is that because it's a process, it looks like a linear process. One step goes to the next step and goes to the next step and goes to the next step. But it's not really like that. We say that every research process has to have the flexibility of revisiting previous activities. Why? The reason is that when you start research, sometimes you may start with a question and go into design a study and realize that it seems that the people are not even are not are not interested in this particular this uh, topic that you are trying to research on. Hence, we are forced 
to go back and either refine the question or refine the topic. For example, you are trying to do research on why um, the impact of smartphones on market women in Agbozome. Now, Agbozome is a part of Ghana, which is in the Volta region. Good. Now, you show up there and you realize that nobody is owning a smartphone. So it means that the selection, the data source has a problem. So what do you have to do? You go back and change your design. And if you don't take care, you still want to do the study in Agbozome. Maybe then you have to talk about the impact of basic phones or feature phones, which are the non-smartphones, on market women. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Because what you realize is that there was something is not what you wanted to do that's not there's no sufficient data for it, so you cannot analyze it. You cannot even answer the question. Hence, you have to come back and change the question. And if you change the question, it means that you are going to change the design again. It happens that way. It happened to me when I was doing my PhD. I was collecting data. I was doing a collecting data on e-commerce in Ghana. And there was a bank that was interested in the work that I was doing. So to be able to do my study, I did a pilot study where I went to survey and talk to the bank to find out whether they one whether they'll be interested in the study two to whether what form of e-commerce are they using, what internet act activities are they doing with the um, with their banking systems, so that I can be able to see, see whether my questions can be answered by them and how was the maturity. For example, if a bank just adopted internet yesterday and I'm going to study them. On, on internet banking in that bank, it may not be relevant because they just began yesterday. So I wanted to know the, the maturity that the bank had gone through. So I got one bank that was interested. That was in um, April 2006. So in October 2006, I, I went back to the bank to go and do the main study. I, I got my questionnaire right. I got my protocol. Everything was OK. Got my permissions to be able to enter into the company. When I got there, the company said that, oh, whilst you are away, we were bought by a Nigerian bank. Now we are moved on, and now we are restructuring. So we are not, re even though we are willing to be part of the study, can you wait when we restructure? That was October, and they will finish the restructuring at the end of the year. So the study can only be done somewhere in February in the next year. Now this tells you that because your research is also time bound, you have to drop them. So there was a change in my what my research design, and because of that, I had to drop all the banks that I was going to do because I was going to compare banks, and then now I went, I went stopped by the banks and went to manufacturing companies. You see, so now my e-commerce study now was not about banks now, now just more about manufacturing companies. Now, sometimes you may realize that you have begun with an interesting topic, so interesting, you're enthusiastic about it, but nobody is interested in it. Or you may realize that you don't have sufficient data to support it. Well, I had a student who was doing a study on contemporary marketing practices of tourist sites in Ghana evidence from the northern region but he was working there then he got a promotion at work and they took him to greater Accra, which is in the southern belt of ghana so you are leaving the north to come to the south so i told him that it would be better to change the evidence to from the southern part of ghana than the northern part of ghana now the nature of tourist activities in the north is different from the southern part of ghana so it means that certain variables and the discussions that you have will change. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So you may start with a very interesting study, and sometimes you may need to change it. So we say that it is not every research process that you have should have the flexibility of revisiting previous activities. Secondly, the researcher should also know that it's not as really linear, it's more realistically cyclical. It impacts on each other, so it keeps on going. You are like you are, in a, you, are like, you are you are like in a loop. You find this, it comes back, it can inform this. So as you are progressing, you should know that other elements in relevance to your theory, in connection to your theory, can impact on each other. Good. You may also realize that because of this, we say that the researcher has to have a bird's eye view of the research process. That means that you should have to be able to, whenever you choose a topic, ask yourself. What is the maturity level of the data source? To be able to answer that. Do you even have access to the data source? I had a student who was working in a bank, and because he was working there, he wanted to do a study on internet banking in that particular bank. But he wanted to do internet banking from the bank's perspective, not from the customer perspective. So it means that he'll be interviewing bank employees and then taking snapshots of the banking internet software. 
when he was ready his boss told him that you can't take it it's not permitted for you to take pictures of the bank internet software because of confidentiality reasons and because of that he he it actually affected a study he now had to do with something which was much more like a customer and bank perspective so he interviewed customers and interviewed the bankers at the same time not more of just entirely the bank perspective when you wanted, the first one he wanted to study the back end now he wanted to get the perspectives of the when he changed the topic he wanted to get the perspectives of the customers on the front end of the internet banking application or website that they were had developed and launched so you may start but sometimes you may not have access so you have the best eye view when you choose a topic think about it will i have access will i be able to do the study as i'm expecting it Good. now what are the different types of research there are different types can be differentiated by application of the research who is going to benefit from the research secondly the purpose and objectives of the research why we are doing the research and thirdly the inquiry procedure how we carry out the research okay so let's see the first type is that application and use of the research now we have pure research and or basic research and applied research now these two types of research define how we use the research outcome for pure research the focus is on the scientific community and the focus is on the rigor of the process so when you do a research and it's going to be published in a scientific journal we usually focus we, we term that one as the pure or basic research it means that from that from the onset of research your audience is the scientific community so the scientific community is more concerned about the scientific procedures that i told the systematic procedures and principles whether they are being adhered to so is it reliable what's the validity what's the sample size these are the questions they are going to ask they're going to focus more on the rigor of the research process however when you come to applied research applied research is more about the informing others the other part of the research who is going to benefit from the research how does it inform policy and practice how does it bring change in the society so applied research focuses more on the outcome of the results whilst pure research focuses more on the process of getting to the results now in applied research you can have two key types of research you have evaluation research and social impact research evaluation research is a type of research that is done to uh, assess the effectiveness of a particular intervention you put a particular thing in the community and want to see what is the effectiveness so you hear of m and e monitoring and evaluation most of these things are evaluatory type of research the thing is finished you want to see come evaluate the the research to see whether the, the uh, objectives have been achieved then we have got social impact assessment this is a type of assessment that is done to be able to see the potential impact of an intervention before it's put in the community so you want to put a borehole in a particular town like Konongo in, in, in the eastern part of Ghana and you ask a question that what is the potential impact of this borehole in this particular community now so you send out as a research you develop a questionnaire to go into the community to find out what will be the potential impact sometimes maybe a building project being put up and you want to see the potential impact of the building project because maybe because of the building project some roads have to be closed or some diversions have to take place you have to sometimes you have to even um, maybe connect a pipe so you disconnect the pipe or or you are building a factory and may have an impact on the activities in the particular community so you want to ask yourself what would be the potential social impact assessment in certain parts of the world like in the US and even in Bristol in UK when you have certain construction projects you need to be able to inform the district office that this is going to be done there and then you actually have to get consent so sometimes a debate can be done in the community based on that and after that somebody write a report that these are the views of what the community is saying and it's scientifically done it's not just random randomly saying that uh, somebody says he doesn't like it but actually doing investigations to find out that um, or conducting research to find out whether people like the project or not or what would be the potential impact if this particular maybe library is built in the community you may re just realize that even the community doesn't want a borehole they would have wanted a football park or something different so the borehole will be done and to become a white elephant nobody will use it they are more happy to work miles to go and fetch water at a river than use your borehole so that could actually happen in a particular community so in applied research and in pure research differ some point out that pure research usually looks at the highest standards of scholarship that's the focus and 
the internal logic and rigor of the research design becomes very very important whilst in applied research our focus is much more on what whether the, it will be of interest to the sponsors so in sometimes in some applied research when you finish your research and you give it to the sponsor the the sponsor may modify the content to communicate a position or may suppress some information to communicate a position because there is the sponsor is has to make sure that the findings are of interest to him see so some scientists argue that applied research can be quick and dirty if you compare it to the scientific standards that is being required of and it's more success comes when results are used by the sponsor if the sponsor uses it then success comes success comes in basic research when it is published in an academic journal when it's published in an academic journal after a series of reviews it means that the scientific community has accepted your work in terms of the purpose of research research can be differentiated by or classified into exploratory descriptive and explanatory and sometimes predictive exploratory research seeks to explore an area of research where little is known or little research has been done in the on that particular in a in, in particular context concerning that particular topic for example in 2007 um, i worked on a paper with a friend which we titled preliminary insights into m commerce mobile commerce adoption in ghana now at that time even mobile phone penetration in ghana which is now over 100 percent was nowhere at 60 percent in 2007 however mobile phones were being used for business activities so we're saying that and it was one of the first research which was being done so we're saying that preliminary insights into m-commerce adoption kind of an exploratory research to see what is the relevance of mobile phones for business and we looked at fishermen and farmers at of that time good and um, um our co-author henson and Bwedi did a very good job in that work however today when Ghana is now having almost 11 and 112 percent penetration of mobile phones and you say you are doing an exploratory research on mobile phones it doesn't add up but you could do exploratory research on mobile phones in Ghana maybe if you are trying to look at mobile broadband which are just rich almost 58 percent penetration rate in Ghana in May it was 50 percent now it's about 58 minus minus um 4g i'm talking about 3g okay now so if mobile internet has reached 58 percent and there's no much research in that area somebody wants to do it he could do an exploratory research to be able to give us insights into what is going on concerning mobile internet how are Ghanaians using it what forms of how do they even get mobile internet what, what's their daily usage and what are they using it for are they just what's happening or they're facebooking and what what are their views concerning speed you see these are some of the new questions you could actually ask so we could do an exploratory research on a topic that little is known about it or much is known but little is known about it in a different area or a different context so you could actually pick mobile most of, most of the research that has been done on mobile phone adoption in ghana from my perspective has been done recently on micro trading activities like fishermen's farmers traders now if i was doing a study now i could actually pick mobile phone adoption by high school student most high school students are not required by, by Ghanaian law are not supposed to take mobile phones to school and but when they come home they are on their ipads they are using mobile phones as if it's a given thing and even their best the best they present is asking from that is an as an s4 or an s5 i hope you understand what i'm trying to say so what is the relevance of mobile phones and how has it been to high school students who are seen to be minus in use in the usage of mobile phones I, I hope you understand what i'm trying to say and that could be give us fresh insight to your perspective i did a study on mobile phone um, technology phobia among the elderly and the person was into we did this it was in nigeria and what the study was looking at post 60 and how they use computers and mobile phones so that could be a very, a very interesting study that will give us fresh insights I, I, I hope you understand what i'm trying to say about exploratory study means that we could, a study could be we could know much about a topic but we may not know much about it in a, in a different context for example there's a lot of research on aids in ghana on aids in africa but somebody could do a research on the impact of aids stigmatization on 
teachers living with AIDS in high schools. You see, now you have picked a subtopic within the big issue about AIDS. You are looking at about stigmatization, not in just in the society in general, but among a particular group of people. Because apparently in some, um, some um, um, schools, primary schools and high schools, when you go and tell your head teacher that you have got AIDS, he may remove you from the school. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. But there is actually um, a, a, a call for the fact that this might not be the best way to handle the situation because you're actually taking their livelihoods, source of livelihoods away. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. But the question that comes ethically, are you supposed to tell? So it's like, don't tell, tell business. And the exploratory study could actually tell, to could bring insight to teachers living with AIDS who, are not, who have refused to tell. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Just because of the stigmatization that could come up, even in the community, you go to a village and they say you have got AIDS, and you're a teacher in that community. Nobody comes to school there. <laughs> For literary research, I'm bringing some insights into that area. Next thing is descriptive research. Descriptive research seeks to, seeks to systematically describe a phenomenon or situation or problem. Usually ask the what and how. Whilst exploratory was asking more of a what, this one asks a what and how. For example, what are the attitudes of the community towards the community library, or what are the living conditions in farming communities in Ghana? Now, when we say what are the attitudes of a community towards the community library, you are asking that what are the attitudes? Attitudes are things that are habits. You need some time to study them to be able to establish that it's an attitude. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So you cannot just go and just ask a one, give a questionnaire to somebody, and yes, the person just answer, and then you're able to establish the attitudes. So what may a descriptive research like this may require you to spend some time sit in the library to actually watch people come into the library. Sit outside the library to see what people do outside the library. And even go into the community to even discuss with people in the in, in the marketplaces or at the um lorry stations and at certain public places to find out what their views are concerning the library now if you did only what their views are you are getting perceptions but when you go into the libraries you are getting what observations you have to establish that these are the real attitudes so in such a scenario on what are the attitudes of the community towards the community library you have to go into a library not just sit outside the library you have to go into a library to find out what the attitudes are those who tear the books those who hide books, you may be able to find all, all, all about all these things. Now, another person could ask a question that, what are the perceptions of the people concerning the library? Perception. Now, perceptions are quite different. Perception does not really require you to go into the library. You could actually stay outside the library and ask people's perceptions concerning the library. You could actually do an exit study. When people are leaving the library, then you ask them, what are, what's your perception concerning the library? You are going to the library, what's your perception? But if you want to look at attitudes to the library, then you actually have to go. You may even need a uh, frequency uh, data of um, data on people's borrowing patterns to be able to establish attitudes and live instead the conditions of books when they go out and when they come in to be able to know attitudes. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. But that's not perception. When you're studying perception, you don't need to examine the book. But if you're studying attitudes, because the book is bored and taken out, the book now becomes part of what the artifacts in the examination of this in the study. So. Descriptive study goes beyond what exploratory to ask what and how and able to describe what is happening. Now, when we do an exploratory research on mobile phone adoption, we can get insights into what people are using mobile phone for. How they use it and why they use it is a different type of research. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? So exploratory usually will touch, touch the surface. Descriptive will go beyond the surface to describe what is happening beyond the surface. And then explanatory will then go beyond what is the, the, behind the description to find out why is it occurring. See the differences. So if you go into explanatory, we want to know why and how. So a particular phenomenon occurs or exists, or the relationship between two or more factors within a phenomenon. So why and how do firms achieve value? amidst the reported fierce competition. So it means that there's something happening. Somebody did their research to establish that there was what fierce competition. Now another person is doing research to be able to find out that how are firms surviving in the fierce competition. You see, there are two different levels. You have established a, a descriptive research or, a, or a exploratory research could have established that there is what fierce competition. Now you are going behind the fierce competition to establish why and how it occurs. So, Exploratory research, the key variables are not defined. 
So it just gets inside, touches the surface. <coughs> the scripture research it to be able to establish these are the attitudes. You see, it may be able to establish. Then explanatory research, variables and the relationships are this. Why do people act this attitude? Why do they exhibit this attitude? Why is it that students who go to this particular university are the only ones who tearing the books in this particular community library. <laughs> I hope you understand. Why is it that children under 15 years old like coming to a library after 2 p.m.? I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So it's establishing relationships about what observations. The observations that you found in exploratory or descriptive have rel the scripture can tell you that tell you that in the library there are different types of users. There are those who are casual users heavy users and that all there are different types of readers those who read fiction those who read non-fiction and those who read political satire i hope you understand what i'm trying to say and there are different why is it that so if you see a five-year-old picking a political book you are a little a book on abraham lincoln you are a little bit confused that why would a five-year-old want to read a book on abraham lincoln and maybe it's like a, a encyclopedia on him but if you go to the library, some libraries have got videos, and you see a five-year-old going to where there is Care Bears, where there is Ben 10, where there is Spider-Man, comics on Spider-Man, you are not surprised. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So what we try to do here is that we are trying to understand the key variables and the relationships between them. Here we are trying to just define the variables. Good. Sometimes in research, one of your questions can be exploratory, and another question can be can go beyond exploration to become descriptive. Sometimes research can be like that. In my PhD, when I was trying to study um, how Ghanaian firms combine, um, combine and deploy resources to be able to gain value from e-commerce, first questions I asked are what, Ghani what are Ghanaian firms using e-commerce for? That was very exploratory. Then I went on to ask that how are they able to use it like that? Then I want to say, what variables, so how, what the variables? I say, how do they combine those resources to be able to generate that value? So what value are they gaining from it? How do they create the value? And how do they will sustain the value? So you see that you are combining different types of it, but in entirely, what's your key research question will tell you what your research is, what exploratory, descriptive or explanatory. So somebody can be doing an a descriptive research, but some of his sub questions will start with the exploratory, then lead to what? The descriptive. But the core question is what? Descriptive. Okay. Now you can have predictive research, which goes further by focusing the likelihood of similar situation occurring elsewhere. Now let me give a very simple scenario, which may be relevant. You know, most of the time if you're watching the English League and they are doing commentary, and Liverpool is playing Manchester. They will give you all the three derbies that have gone now. In 2006, when they met, this guy won. In 2007, when they met, this guy won. In 2010, when they met, this guy won. This guy has never won at home. This guy has always won an away. So then they ask you a question that currently, because of the police player and this player in it, and this player being um, hurt, and because he's not playing, and because you are selling Gerard. What then happens? Then they will do an analysis to tell you that the outcome of the game will be 3 2. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So you see that they study the past to be able to make a prediction of what will come in this fight. Well, it's like a company saying that we are looking behind to be able to study patterns of selling maybe uh, ice cream at Christmas time to be able to predict how much ice cream we should produce this Christmas. Now, you may do all your predictions. What if on 25th, um, 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 the Christmas day, the pattern of the weather changes and it snows throughout, people are not able to go out. Your ice cream will be ready. And it's so cold, people may buy more coffee and more tea than more, more hot ice cream. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. But your predictions were right, but how maybe by global warming, something happens and that year something changes. Another interesting example is, um, about three years ago, when we lo lost our belated president in Ghana, President Mills. Now, some of the 
textile companies had to produce a cloth with his picture on it and sell. But these companies were not going to, it was in June, they were already going to release a, what, a summer cloth. But because of the fact that the president had been, was, was then late, what happened, happen, what happened was that some of them, you pull back some of the stock that you intended to take to the market and then what? So you can do predictive research all right, but sometimes certain events can actually choose. So that's why we said predicting invest is more about forecasting the likelihood of a similar situation what occurring. Doesn't mean that it will occur. Okay. But it's good to plan on ahead with predictive research. Good. So predictive research provides how, why, and where. You see now, it's adding where answers to current events as well as similar events in the future. As it answers the question of what if. That's what it does. Now, in terms of the inquiry procedure, we can have one, the approach of the research, and then time dimension of the research. So, in terms of approach, you could, there is quantitative research, qualitative, and mixed methods. Now, when we say quantitative research, it means that we are quantifying what we are trying to study by numbers. So, we are quantifying them. We are trying to describe the variation in what you are trying to study. So to, to determine the extent of a problem or existence of a relationship between aspects of a phenomenon by quantifying the variation. Most of the methods you see in quantitative research is survey. In fact, that's the basic method, in, one of the basic methods in quantitative research. Now, qualitative research tends to explore the meanings and values and attitudes people associate with a particular thing. So it's very textual, it's more descriptive, it's more about words. Interesting thing about qualitative research is that whenever you are doing it, it's more concerned about what people are feeling about the situation, what the meaning they associate with it. For example, let's take a pen. The pen in your hand is just a packet pen in your hand can is just a pen. But when you go into a bank, you use the pen to sign a check. So it becomes a means of assessing what finances. When you go from the bank and you go home as a parent and your child brings his or her assignment to you, to you, and you look at it in Ghana, you're supposed to sign, to show a sign of what responsibility, you, that you have verified what is on the content that the, the assignment is your child has done before it takes you to school. Now, on your wedding day, when they give you the registration forms, you're supposed to sign, attesting that you want to marry a Jua or AC. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Now, all of them, the packet pen or the big pen you're using has not changed. What has been changing? The context in which you use the pen is what changes. So in qualitative research, we try to look at the, con the context in which the research is occurring and see how the context inform the meanings that we associate with what we are trying to study. I hope you understand what I'm trying to so say. A, a pen in the hand of a president can be life and death. If it signs that you are fired, you are dismissed, you are gone. It can also sign amnesty for somebody in prison. I, I hope you know that. That same pen can change somebody's life, can also make somebody's life a hell. So what we are trying to say is that the, the power is not in what? The pen. It's in what? The context in which the pen is used. The power is only if you are going for your visa, American visa, and that day your pen stops writing. <laughs> and the consular tells you that your pen, he doesn't have an expert pen for you. You, are, you can't borrow any other pen. I think <laughs> you may be <laughs> saying that it's African magic. <laughs> anyway, so qualitative research brings in the context to bear in research. Then we have got mixed methods research. Mixed methods combine the strength of both quantitative and qualitative so that we can be able to use the, the fact that we can look at the extent of variation here to support the meanings we associate here. Because when you look for meanings, meanings may not be generalized. It could only be just in that locality. But you can then check whether these meanings you have found, to what extent is it represented in the a larger society? Hence, you do a quantitative study. So somebody can do a quantitative after a qualitative to be able to establish the, well, the strengths of the relationships that he has found in the society or the hypothesis that he had. Now, another person too can also do a mixed method but it's just mixed qualitative and only mixed quantitative. Let me get it right. Quantitative methods differ. There are quite a number of them. There's experiment, there is survey, there are different types of quantitative methods. Qualitative methods has got different types. There's case studies, ethnography. Mm? 
there are different types of there's even other forms of other research you can do in qualitative research so somebody can mix multiple what quantitative methods or can mix qualitative methods or can mix a quantitative and a qualitative so let's get it right so when you say mixed methods what do you mean by mixed methods Good. now if you mix your data collection methods it's not a mixed method what do i mean by that you collect some of the data by interview and collect some of the data by um observation you have not mixed the methods <laughs> it's your data collection methods that are that differ it's not a mixed method study you see basically both observation and interviews are all used in qualitative research it will be used for case study to be able to establish a case or can be both be used for um, an ethnography research to be able to understand a society or cultural patterns in a particular society so don't say that because you have mixed the data collection or if you interview uh, ladies and go interview men you have not done mixed methods <laughs> no i'm just saying is mix that's mixed data sources okay so quantitative study could look who stayed like it. to what extent have students adopted mobile phones to what extent or have a hypothesis like students who obtain grade a never miss a class so you want to prove whether that hypothesis is true or not qualitative research may ask what is the working condition in the banking industry what are the perceptions of traditional medicines among what nurses that could be a qualitative question that is being asked or a mixed method study could ask what are the type of primary schools in the city of accra uh, and the extent of their popularity so it means that the first part you could do a qualitative study to understand the different types of primary schools in accra and the second part you can check their popularity among parents i hope you understand me now let me just give you a closer detail this same question could be only quantitative especially when if you go to ministry of education they can give you the types of primary schools and it's established already so you don't need to do another study to be able to establish the type of primary schools so in that mean in that case you just go straight to what after getting the framework of the different types of primary school you just have to go and do your study on their popularity I hope you understand me however if there is no document that tells you the type of primary school but you do focus group discussion with different head of masters headmasters like head teachers or with different principals of different schools and even from with people from ministry of education to be able to establish the different type of primary school international school under trees school within trees all those ones are there <laughs> then what you have actually done is that you have been able to establish based on the focus group discussion the different types of our primary schools then you can follow up with a quantitative study to do what establish which of them is more popular so the first one which was focus group is qualitative the second one which is survey it then becomes what quantitative so you have a mixed method study okay now research can also be differentiated by what the time the timing with the time dimension of the research now we have got what we call cross-sectional research and longitudinal research the fact is time influences research in the manner in which data is collected with respect to time if i come into i'm doing a research and i'm asking what are your views concerning the government in this community and i enter into the community i'm asking them the question and i ask them to ask of today it's more of a cross-sectional study i'm cutting across time and asking today what are your views concerning government now it's likely that the people may just reflect on what has been happening within the last two months or the last year to be able to define what their perceptions on government is however if the night before government came to give free education and give some money to almost every household in that community that money if you show up and ask what are your views concerning government it may be a very interesting view almost everything will be positive how then the same way if you leave and after you have left that's when government comes to rather give the something to them or gives them some money or give them new pipe bomb water as you have been looking for for the next 10 years for example last four weeks 
a commission was done in Adenta, which is part of Greater Car Region, that after seven years or so, water has gone through pipe for ministers to come and honor it. And I think the president was even there to inaugurate it, to commission the project, that water is now flowing through pipes of people. So can you just imagine that after that evening, interviewing people on what are your views on the government? Oh, even though they took a long time, our government has listened to us. I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. However, if that same research was done uh, two weeks ago, before that commission, we know they are doing something, but we are not very sure <laughs> of what they are doing. The views could be different. So cross-sectional study gives us the views of the people at that point in time. Then we have longitudinal study that tries to get the views of people concerned over time. So in cross-sectional study, a researcher collects information from a sample drawn from a population. The data you obtain is derived from a cross-section of the population at one point of time. That today. You don't go back again. Now, longitudinal study is quite different. We collect data over time. The first type of longitudinal study I'll talk about is panel study. Panel study means that you have a panel of people that are answering your questions. And over time, maybe in every six months, every six months you go. Now, what you are trying to do is to try to get the people's views concerning an issue, issue to observe the changes in the specific respondents and highlight the reasons for those changes. You see what is happening? You are learning what is happening over the, concerning the issue over time. So almost every three months, you go back and ask a question. I've done a longitudinal study with a company for about 10 years. Almost every two years, I go back to the company to find out what's the impact of e-commerce in your company. So I've been seeing different changes and different f I forms and usage of e-commerce on that company and based on different decisions and di bif different dispensations of leadership. This leader comes, he changes the view of e-commerce. This leader comes, he changes the view of e-commerce. Or the nature of the business, as it changes over the years, the importance and relevance of e-commerce changes in the company. So it's very interesting. I could say that maybe the first time when I was studying the company in 2004, e-commerce was the best thing they have ever had. But as of 2010, 2012, e-commerce was relegated to some, a second resource. It wasn't a primary resource, a secondary resource in the company. It means that it doesn't receive as much attention or focus or primary investment as it or primary aspect of the budget of the year as it was when it was, the company was in 2004. So it has allowed me as a researcher to study the different changes. And each time I go back, I talk to the same people. When somebody falls, I don't replace. I just talk to the same people in that role so that I can get the people what they have gone through over time. Now, you can also have cohort study. Now, cohort study, the population is the same. So we let's take a group of students who have studied a particular or who were given iPhones in 2010. Now, you want to study the impact of iPhone usage upon on, among those students. So every nine months, you come and ask them questions. But what you do is that every nine months, you sample out of the group of 50 students that you met. So the, f the first year, you give them 50 phones to use. So then you ask about 10 of them about what's your view on the iPhone. The next year you came, when you come back, you, you do a survey, but with another 10, you don't repeat any of the 10, but you stick to the same 50. So you can actually go through about five times, picking different types of people and interviewing them. So in that means that a cohort is being done. A cohort longitudinal study, the population remains the same, but different respondents are sampled each time we come back. Now, the researchers' aim here is to see if there are changes in the perceptions or trends that occur in the study. So it's no more concerned about the individuals just use about the general usage by the group. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. While this one is more concerned about those specific respondents, this one is not concerned. Panel is more concerned about those specific variables you are studying. Cohort is not just concerned about that. Then you've got time series. Time series and longitudinal study usually study at different points in time. So you can plot the levels of crime in a particular community over time to know when it, which month that it increases and then which one it decreases. That can actually help you. For if that particular month, all your peaks are at the time that was getting close to the election, it gives you an indication that election periods in Ghana over the past 20 years 
always has an upset of crime in this community. You see what's happening. Because what you have actually studied is that you have realized that every December or every November, December, crime in this community increases. And November, December, and it doesn't happen in every year. It happens almost every four years whenever there's election. What does it tell you? So time series can help you understand a phenomenon at different points in time, often with a view of studying the social trends that are going on. Good. So in a nutshell, we have been able to go through what research is, the different types of research, and what, how research can be classified. So I will ask a question. The journalist analysis usually engage in a number of investigative assignments which generate reports on ills in society. Anas the journalist in Ghana. By exposing these ills, Anas seeks to make society better. He has won a number of international awards in recognition of his reports. From your understanding of research, do you think Anas is conducting research? Hmm? Do you think Anas is conducting research? Uh -huh. Okay, so from my point of view, I think Anas is conducting a research. Yes, because from the slides, from the previous slides, there was exploratory research which talks about looking at phenomenon, how things are happening in a context, in a situation. So Anas looks at what is going on maybe in an industry, in an organization, for example, the one he conducted with the electricity company of Ghana. And then there was another one on the driver vehicle licensing authority. So that's actually a research there. And then from there, he also, for instance, the DVLA escapade, the DVLA um, investigation he conducted. Mm -hmm. He went further to look at the impact on those fake driver's licenses on the society where it led to road accidents and even after the road accidents the impact on the society and um, the victims the victims and then their families where people were left um orph orphans and then other issues so i think anas is really conducting a research okay uh, i think anas is conducting a research but the, the question is maybe the type of research he is conducting whether it, it can be a, b a basic research because you don't know whether uh, he's following a part all the scientific communities' approaches. Uh, so I think it would be more of an applied research because it, it is more of, more of a social impact assessment on the community. And for instance, with the Ghana electricity teams, you see, the results was to help uh, give your know, impact on the society the, what they don't know or what is going on that they don't know of. So I think it's a type of research. Uh, the applied research. Um, I share in the same view, but I think if what Anas is doing is accepted in the community in which he belongs to, that's the journalism community. If the the process is following is a rigor process, rigorous process that is accepted there, then that should be a basic research in his field but then if it is not accepted then we'll take it as an applied research okay i i do agree with all that you have all both of all the three of you have said um i think you have got your points there Anas is conducting a research because of many other reasons as you you've pointed out and um i like the last one that you said that if you look at the fact that you have focus, you see he belongs to a scientific community and that scientific community has awarded him and um, give him accolades global and, um, and then even local or international and local, you've actually realized that the guy has been accepted as, 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 a re, as an investigative researcher within his community. We also pointed out the fact that it could actually be some of his research is more applied, others is also could be seen as basic research so far as if he's uh, publishing it within the, the, the domain of the, sci um, of the, the science of journalism and it's accepted there, then we can take it as a research there. So that means he gives me a very, a very good set of answers that, that you have actually pointed out. And um, I'm very happy about it because in other, this has been debased in other departments and other places that have taught the same course where people, students have actually debated vigorously the fact that this is no research. And I realize that they bring the sentiments they have for Anans to answering the question than to, to um, addressing the issue. Okay. So from, we could actually answer it from the perspective of 
whether it's basic or applied we can also look at it from the definition of research which is actually what i was expecting and i saw that you you actually uh, did that you went on to point out the fact that it's a research because of the f- whether he has satisfied what principles and procedures that has been systematically outlined by the journalism discipline okay so thank you very much so in a nutshell the whole what we have been trying to do today is to understand the different types of research to understand what research is and what research is not to also appreciate um, the types of research and um, what goes into why we do research the purpose of research the um, the different approaches of research and also the a- a aspects of what happens when there's an absence of research the next session will be looking into how we select a research topic because it's very relevant that the centrality of every research is a question that is being asked so if you don't have a topic how then do you start your research so that's the next topic that we'll be doing when we meet thank you